We're going to be looking at Deuteronomy 18 as we begin our day, week, and year. And it's a short chapter, and it seems like it has three main subjects that almost don't seem to relate to each other until you, you back off and look at them. And since it's short, we'll read these divisions. The first little bit is about the priests. And then there's a portion about where you get your information, your counsel, your advice. And then the final one speaks of a prophet that God will raise up. <clears throat> the Levitical priests, the whole tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's offerings, and of course this is Yahweh, by fire and his portion. They shall have no inheritance among their countrymen. The Lord is their inheritance, as He promised them. I think we're all aware of what this means now. This means in the land, it was partitioned by tribe. Just like when you look at the United States, it's partitioned by state. We have 50 states. And each one of these states is in a sense a sovereign government, but they all are under a federal government that creates one nation. Well, Israel is very much the same. It has 12 tribes. They're all <coughs> distinct, but they're under one national identity. But Levi is different in that when the tribes are given their portions, he's not given one. I think some people in the house of Aaron have been confused about what it meant because they, they had houses, they had homes, they, they, they had things, but they did not have an inheritance. They did not have an area of the country that was theirs. Then this goes on to say, Now this shall be the priest's due from the people, from those who offer a sacrifice, either an ox or a sheep, of which they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. Well, that's a blessing. You shall give him the first fruits of your grain, your new wine, and your oil, and the first shearing of your sheep. For the Lord your God has chosen him and his sons from all your tribes to stand and serve in the name of the Lord forever. So the, here's our chapter it's starting, and it's saying, One tribe doesn't have an inheritance, but their inheritance is the Lord, and because the Lord is their inheritance, Every offering, a certain portion goes to the priest. This is where we understand being supported by the offerings by fire. The other thing, the first fruits go to the priests. So it, it mentions here specifically the grain, the new wine, the oil, and the first shearing of your sheep. This goes to the Levites. Why? Because they're to stand and serve, and this word serve here could be worship. Minister. That's. Now he goes on to say, if a Levite comes from any of your towns throughout Israel where he resides, and he comes whenever he desires to the place which the Lord chooses, then he shall serve in the name of the Lord his God, like all his fellow Levites who stand there before the Lord. They shall eat equal portions, except what they receive from the sale of their father's estates. It's not as clear in the uh, New American Standard updated, which I just read. That might make sense to you, but all it's saying is that when a priest sells his belongings and comes to Jerusalem, he still shares equally in the distribution of the priesthood. It's irrelevant what he has. He keeps that. It's not what you'd call fair. That's how it is. <laughs> I always wondered how this worked. But in any case, so if we start off with this chapter with the tribe that's set apart. They don't have an inheritance. God is their inheritance, and since God is their inheritance, that means the first fruits and certain portions of the offerings from every Israelite go to them. This is to support them as they support Israel by serving at the temple. Now the next part is 9 through 13. And it says, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. 
In fact, in Genesis it says, I'm not going to kick out the people in the land until their wickedness reaches the full measure. And when the sin of the Amorites reaches that measure, I'm going to push them out and bring you in. So the Lord says, when you come into the land, don't imitate certain things. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. What's interesting to me, does that seem pretty plain? I think it's pretty plain. Do you know how many Christians are not aware of that? I, and you might think about it and, and share with all of us why you think God's so strong about this, but he's very clear. You're not to consult any other way of getting information, particularly the occult, uh, sorcerers, witches. For instance, what does this say about reading your horoscope? Shouldn't even look at it. I know people say, well, it's kind of funny. Well, it probably is, and I guess that's all right. The thing that's interesting are the people that somehow will read their horoscope and think it actually means something because, wow, is it always wrong. It's like my fortune cookies I get at Panda. They're not very often right. <laughs> and they have something on Facebook. For those of you on Facebook, if you haven't done this, there's an app you can click on, not an app, but a, a meme you can click on that will tell you what the next year is bringing you. Do that if you need a laugh. For me, it was a wedding, a big wedding. I said, what? Maybe the Lord's returning. <laughs> That's good. That's perfect for me, too. I agree with you there. Anyway, so the Lord's really strong. Don't seek advice outside of, from him. Whoever does the, okay, I didn't, I don't think I read all of this. Maybe, oh yes I did. Whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For those nations which you shall dispossess, Listen to those who practice witchcraft and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. And if you remember, as we start the book of Deuteronomy, God comes to the children of Israel and he stresses to them that he's not like other gods because his relationship with them is through speaking. And it's, he says, you won't see me, you won't see a form, I, I don't look like a fish, a whale, a cow, a bird. But it's my voice. You hear my voice, and that's how you know me. So all these other things are attempting to give us direction and guidance to something tangible. Sorcery, you know, they would uh, kill a rabbit and stretch out its intestines, and that would tell them what to do. And, and the Lord says, no, you don't do that. That's, that's absolutely forbidden. He says, the nations you push out, they did that. You're not allowed to do that. This is an important thing because a lot of people read the story of Balaam and they think he's a prophet of God because he does hear the voice of God. But it says very clearly that he's a diviner. And if he's a diviner, he is not a prophet of God because prophets of God don't divine. They don't look at omens and signs. They listen to the voice of the Lord, and certainly, because God is truth, Yeshua is truth, they look at what's true. So we have the priests who are set apart forever. Those we're not to listen to, except the Lord. And now the final part of the chapter, starting with verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. The Lord said to me, They have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen, countrymen like you. Like who? Like Moses, right? 
God, the Lord says, I'm going to raise up a prophet like you. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require of him. Who, whoever doesn't listen to this prophet will bring a judgment on himself. Okay? Now, again, the NI, I like the New American up standard, but it, it translates things so literally that it translates the idioms without, I'd rather have them tell us what the idiom means. We don't say, I'll require of him. We would say it would bring judgment or uh, consequence. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So notice, the Levites are set apart. Their inheritance is God. They're to stand before God. The first fruits are to come to them. You're not to listen to diviners, to witches, to those who practice sorcery. And you're to hear Moses and the prophet who will stand up like Moses. It's all about where you're going to get your information. And when a prophet speaks a word presumptuously that I've not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Now, here's the challenge with that. Sometimes God speaks a word, and how long does it take before it comes to pass? In this portion here, where it says, where the Lord speaks to Moses and says, I'm going to raise up a prophet like you, who's being re to whom are we referring? It's Yeshua, isn't it? Now, how do I know that? It's... Go to Acts set 3. And, and I thought about this because often when a prophet speaks, in fact, we forget when we read the book of Revelation or we read the book of Isaiah that a lot of those prophecies came to pass in those prophets' day. That doesn't mean they don't have a later fulfillment, especially Revelation. But the seven churches, a lot of the stuff that happens in Revelation clearly happens with the Roman Empire. Things like this, where it seems to be way out in the distance. You know, it's even in Isaiah where it talks about a virgin shall be with child and bear a son. That's clearly speaking of Mary to come, but it also speaking of Isaiah's wife who has a son. This is another thing that people, yeah, we'll go back and read it. You'll find out it's speaking of a son that Isaiah will have. Acts 3, and now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance. This is Peter preaching. It's not the Pentecost sermon. It's the one in the chapter following. He says, I know you acted in ignorance. And he's speaking of the crucifixion. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And we do have a lot of prophecies that say the Messiah would suffer. Isaiah 53, all through the Psalms. It talks about it. In fact, it is so well developed that the Jewish sages, and I'm sure I've mentioned this before, forecast two comings of the Messiah. A Messiah ben Joseph, or Joseph, the son of Joseph, and the Messiah ben David, the son of David. And of course, the son of Joseph, what was Joseph's life? It was suffering for his family. David is the one who conquered the land, and united the kingdom. And it's always been amazing to me that they predicted a suffering Messiah, and most of them missed it when he came. <laughs> but anyway, Peter says, God prophesied that the Messiah would suffer. That's been fulfilled. And then he says, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Yeshua, the Messiah, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So Peter is saying 
that Yeshua is staying in heaven until what? Until it's time for the restoration of all things. Now Yeshua tells us that someone does that restoration of all things. Who is that? It's Elijah, right? It's Elijah. John came in that form, but Yeshua says, Elijah came and Elijah is coming. Now he goes on to say, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed. So Peter's opinion, if you think Peter has a good opinion, is the prophet in Deuteronomy 18 is Yeshua. That he's the one that we're to listen to. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Now, Peter adds a little there. That's not what it says in Deuteronomy 18. It says, but it, it says God will require it of him. And Peter is giving us the definite version. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of all and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. There's something that's all through the New Testament, and I think we all implicitly know it, and sometimes we may not know how to articulate it. And that is, John starts off by saying that no man has seen God, right? And Scripture is plain. Why has no one ever seen God? Because we can't be in His presence. And yet, so that we could have a relationship with God, God appears in a form that we can be with. And, and just to give you, uh, and this is a crummy analogy, but maybe it will give you some idea. Our life completely depends on the sun. Everybody here agree with that? Without the sun, there would be no light, no photosynthesis, no formation of sugars. We couldn't live, nothing could live. We, we live literally on the power of the sun. What would happen if somebody sent me to the sun? I, it wouldn't be good. I mean, I would be incinerated, what's what, 93 million miles away? Millions of miles from the sun, I would be incinerated. So we have an atmosphere that the sun shines through, and instead of destroying me, it blesses me and gives me life. Now, John was trying to say this in John 1, and sometimes people miss it. He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then he goes on to say, no man has seen God. But then he said, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And as many as received Him, to them gave He the right, the power, to become sons or children of God. It goes back to what Ron was saying in that, his testimony that the Bible is all family. God is not. It's interesting that God's primary representation to Israel over and over is that he's a father or a husband. He repeatedly says, and then he says, you're my children. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. It's a marriage formula. I'll be your husband. You'll be my bride. And, and he, he speaks of it this way. And in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews and, I, and I've, I've come to the conclusion that we don't know the author of Hebrews because God wants to see if we'll be nice about our arguments. <laughs> it's, they didn't know the author of Hebrews way back when they were canonizing Scripture, which is why they almost left it out of the Bible, because they chose the canonical books based on the authorship. If you were Paul or one of the apostles, they thought it belonged. They didn't know who wrote Hebrews. But listen to what Hebrews says. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So the writer of Hebrews is saying something that Paul says often, that not only did Yeshua come to us as the Father so we could see the Father and understand who He was, 
but he created everything through him and in him everything holds together. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. That's the first part of Hebrews 1. I'm going to read some other verses from chapter 2 and then go ahead, Ron. Uh, you might be familiar with this, but I just seen it the other day, but they uh, were, uh, there's actually a, uh, as they got smaller and smaller in the cells, they found the cell that actually holds, it actually is the, the uh, I don't know, well, Teresa probably knows about it too, but anyways, it's what actually holds our flesh and everything together, and it shows the picture of this microscopic cell, and it is a cross. It's shaped of a cross. Oh, I've seen that. What is it? It's a... Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a biological systems. Yeah, I've seen that in the cell membranes. There is something that was a cross. Yeah, that I've got one. holds all our tissues and holds our body together. So, in that scripture, that it yeah. tells that scripture that says in, in the cross all things are held together. Yeah, it, uh, well, yeah, it, it, Colossians really says it this way. It says that, oh, how does it put it? Uh, he has reconciled all things to the Father through his blood. And that, that ever, like you, we were just saying, it's, he says everything has its being, holds together through him, by him. And here in Hebrews 2, he kind of goes on similarly. And, and I want you to be thinking about something because I've noticed that one of the most difficult things we have as believers in Yeshua is how to transmit that belief to someone who doesn't believe. And I think maybe sometimes I've thought that it depended a lot on a good argument or a good presentation when probably it depends a lot more on a life. Because people believe what they see. This is Hebrews 2.14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So he's, he started off by saying that God, through history, spoke to us through the prophets, but now he's speaking to us in the Son. And the Son is the exact representation of the Father. So while we could not be in the presence of the Father, the Son has come and we have seen God and he dwelled among us. We actually know what God is like. We know what His personality is like. We know His character and His attributes because we can look at Yeshua. Now he says, He shared in our flesh and blood that He might render Satan powerless. What's Satan's power? It's death. And He might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does, not help, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And this is a familiar refrain of Hebrews. But let's kind of back off of this a little bit, back up. Deuteronomy 18 starts off by saying, the Levitical tribe, they're set apart. Their inheritance is God. And that inheritance will be forever. That's the word it uses. It says, don't listen to the occult. Don't go to spiritists, the people that seek the spirits of the dead. All It says, don't go there. Now, I'm going to raise up a prophet. What's interesting, and Hebrews is really the only book that does this, is it relates the prophet who's raised up like Moses to a priest. 
I would just challenge you, I'd be interested to see if you can find any book outside of Hebrews that plainly identifies Yeshua as a priest. And of course, the writer of Hebrews, no one knows who he is, he goes to great pains to tell us that Yeshua is not a Levite. And that if he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest. His priesthood is in heaven. His, the priest goes through the physical ministry here on earth, but the spiritual ministry in heaven is through the blood of Yeshua. See, sometimes people get this messed up. If you took human blood into the temple, it defiles it. You can't take human... I mean, take a look at yourself. You're unclean. You do not divide the hoof nor chew the cud. I think you're glad about that. <laughs> but, uh, so we, we have this relationship and what is the purpose of the priests? And, and I, I think about this quite a bit and I'm sure you do too because we've heard about this restoration that God's restoring all things. In fact, didn't we just read that Yeshua does not return until all things are restored. Now, is it something spoken by God's holy prophets that he would restore the priesthood? Yeah, read Malachi. I've sent this judgment on you that my covenant with Levi can continue. Suddenly, the messenger you are, the Lord you are seeking will come to my temple, come to this temple, and he'll sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, then offerings will be made. So there is, there is a restoration prophesied of the priesthood that is something we'll see or at least be in process before Yeshua returns. But there's a relationship between the priesthood and Yeshua who's a Melchizedek priest. He's not a Levitical priest. And uh, when I think of a priest, well, maybe I should ask you, what, when you think of a priest, what does a priest do? What's that? Serves. He serves. That's the uh, uh, Exodus 28. You'll set them apart to serve or minister as priests. But what, what does that ministry look like? What do they do? He intercedes for the people. Okay, that's one thing. He, he is an intercessor. He's an intermediary, right? Isn't that something that's come all through this? What is Yeshua? He's an intermediary. And in fact... Without that intermediary, what's our access to the Father? It's cut off. Sister Betsy. I was just going to say, kind of the same thing as to minister would be to go in and to spend time with the Lord and then what is heard during that ministry to God to bring back to the people to teach. So, it, yeah, all right. So, you've, you've said a couple things that I think are important. Would you all agree with me that the teaching is an indispensable part of priesthood? Did you have it? Yeah, I, I think that's one of the, the critical functions. It's not that you make it possible for somebody to do something, but you educate them to be to do it able themselves. to do everything that God has said they can do. Yes, in other words, you, in a chemical sense, you're a catalyst. You're not the reaction. You, you help them to be what God created them to be. Where the priesthood gets between people and God, it's outside of where it belongs. It, and, and there's a great writing, 2.18, that mentions that in the last days, the role of Aaron is to go to those who sleep in the dust of the earth and to communicate to them, I think it says, the way of holiness and the path of righteousness. That's what, and it's not that they'll walk that, it's they'll help people walk that. So there's this relationship between these two and I, and I mentioned the teaching thing because what I noticed, you know, I, I love media, I like reading stuff, you, you know that I'm an information junkie. And there's a real danger in this because there's too much information out there. When, when everybody agree, we have too much information. And I don't know how it got sent to me, but something was sent to me on that the Holocaust was a hoax. And that it's the worst hoax ever perpetrated on the people of the world. And uh, it must be a Zionist conspiracy. 
And, and I, I started to read through some of the stuff this fellow had written. And you know, a lot of people believe this. And I don't want to spend, waste a lot of time on it. But did you know that in Scripture, the day we live in, one of the number one things God says is that we need to be able to be taught. We need to be able to hear it. What Betsy said, if, if Dean hears a word from the Lord and Dean comes and shares it, it is crucial that I can hear it. Because if I can't hear it, it has no ability to bring me life, does it? it, it, it he could bring exactly what God is saying. And if I can't receive it, it does absolutely no good. It's the parable of the sower and the seeds that's spread on the hard ground. And I was thinking, something is happening to the minds of people. It's always been there, but I am frightened for the ability, for the people's ability to think and make rational decisions. And, and there are very many fine people that get tripped up in this way. And the Holocaust is a good one to look at because they pick at facts and put them together and they ignore things like this. How do you fool that many people? If you go to Israel, every other person you bump into, their grandparents, their parents, somebody they know died in a gas oven. Do you know how many people have to be in on this conspiracy? And the other thing is, the people that did it admit they did it. I was just reading a story about a German man who when he uh, got to be an adult, he was studying, I, he was a scientist. And I don't remember, if, if, I think a physicist, I'm not sure. But something led him to go research what his dad had done during the war. And he found out that his dad was one of the guards at a concentration camp. That he was responsible for killing people, burning people, all kinds of stuff. And he was so horrified that he broke off his relationship with his dad. He went to Israel and he's converted to Judaism. He's raised his family as Jews. But he was convicted by the Lord that he needed to go back and see his dad. And uh, he, he talked to his father. And the thing that's odd, his dad knows what he did was repulsive. But it's almost like he has a hard time being sorry for it. It's, it but here's the thing I find amazing. There are millions of people out there thousands anyway, who have participated like his dad in this, and they'll tell you they did. And yet there are, ask, here's one of the things, whenever you hear something is a conspiracy, stop and ask yourself, why should we not believe this? One of the most important things that we shouldn't believe today is the Holocaust happened. Because if we can be convinced that it didn't, there's no reason for the nation of Israel to exist. And I've mentioned this to you many times. There have been Jews in the land all along, just like there have been Arabs these last few hundred years, a couple thousand. When it was not a Jewish state, Jews lived in peace all through the Arab nations. The minute that Israel became a state, they couldn't live in those nations because it was like they couldn't handle the truth. And I thought about this quite a bit because the inability to process and make decisions. I mean, the internet frightens me. I'll be honest, I'll be honest with you. The medical information on the internet is mostly crap. It's mostly absolute crap. People don't know how to do things. They don't know how to read. Uh, there was a video sent to me on Facebook here just a little while ago on dairying. And you would not believe how they took little snippets of the life. I mean, one of the primary things they did was they showed a cow that had gotten down. And that's a rough thing. If you ever see an old cow, or it could be a young cow, that gets down and can't get up, it is a terrible thing. And a lot of times, they just end up having to be destroyed. Sometimes we can get them going again. But they just had a long sequence showing this cow that was down and these people were obviously abusing, abusing this cow. But then the statement is made, this is what happens on every dairy. This is, how they do, this is how they do it. And then they had a calf born and they took it away from the cow and they had the cow, of course, mooing. And, and, and they make hilarious statements like, <laughs> 
They take the calf away from the cow because they don't want that calf to have the cow's milk. They want to sell that milk to you. And I'm like, I'm sorry, go down to the dairy. There's 50 calves and guess what they're drinking? Mama's milk. The reason we don't leave the calf with the cow, it would kill the calf. It would, that's the truth. But when you don't care about the truth, but you care about an agenda, you put things together. And I'll be really blunt and upfront, the anti-vaccine campaign is the same kind of crap, and I'm tired of it. It has some truth in it, but it ignores the vast weight of medical evidence. And it's causing people to be sick. It's like this flat earth society. What? I saw this picture. <laughs> this guy had drawn of the earth and it was flat and all these people were standing on it. And then it said, how could people hang off the bottom? <laughs> and <laughs> this is hilarious, but I mean, that we're losing the ability to, to understand and ascertain truth because people always have an agenda. I mean, this whole vaccine, anti-vaccine is very much that way. There's an agenda on both sides and it's impossible to step back and say, what's the truth? And one of the things you'll find out is that if you don't know a field, you're much easier to mislead. It's like me, I went through the dairy video and I, I was laughing and angry for the misrepresentation because I know what happens. I know there are people that could be bad dairymen, but the idea that these cows live in pain, and here's the joke, they tell people, don't drink milk, you're causing suffering. What happens if you stop drinking milk? What do they do with that milk? Leave it in the cows, shoot the cow, what, what do you? And the, the same thing on global warming. If you go without meat on Monday, it will help global warming. If you fell for that, would you please come take science from me? Because the day you didn't eat meat, those cows still ate and crapped. <laughs> Earth to Mars. That just means somebody else ate your hamburger. <laughs> I, but do you have any, and another one that was great was that we didn't actually go to Mars. That was all put on. And here, here's the reason I'm taking the time to do this with you. If basically 100% of the people say, saw it and saw that it happened, you better at least back up and say, why am I trying to believe that this didn't happen? Because what ends up happening is that you get a group of people and they become like all the people that saw the emperor with no clothes and because everyone's saying he has clothes, they don't dare say he doesn't. And it takes a little kid that doesn't, isn't in on the... Uh, the, uh, what do you want to call it? The conspiracy, we'll call it that. That he hasn't got any clothes on, you know? And, and I've, I was thinking about this, this man on the moon thing, and I'm not sure why that, somebody didn't want to believe that, but here's the thing that people won't stop to think. When something like that happens, the satellite is tracked all over the world by hundreds, possibly thousands of universities. There are scientists all over the planet tracking the progress of that. They're all tracking it when it lands. Do you know how many people you have to get to lie? If you believe this kind of stuff, what I'm pointing out is in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll catch it up. It says that the people will refuse to love the truth. And because of that, God will send them a lie. And I, what I see today is when we don't want to believe something, we don't let evidence change our minds. And there's nothing more frightening. So when Deuteronomy 18 starts off, it starts off talking about the priests. What's their job? It's to teach. It talks about those you shouldn't listen to. Don't listen to the voices that say, go after other spirits. Go after spiritism. Go check with the dead. It says, don't go there. Go to me. There'll be a prophet raised up like me. Listen to him. That's Yeshua. That's Jesus. And it's a very comfortable thing to follow Yeshua because he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So the truth, we don't have to worry that we're going to learn truth that's going to violate or upset who he is. The truth of the very cells in his body. 
146 tells us, if you're struggling to believe the word, go look at my works. Go look at my creation. Paul says the same thing He's in Romans 1. He says, uh, every, he says, everyone's without excuse because God's eternal nature is present in what he's created. If you look at what Ram is talking about, the cell, or you look at what's inside the cell, I mean, it's incredible now. You know, at one point we thought, boy, the cell is small, but I think you're all aware now what we found inside cells. Mitochondria, Golgi bodies. I, there's a world inside the cell, just like it says in 293. There's a world in there. And, and here's the other incredible thing, that we know all this increasing complexity. We know all this. Just It's amazing. Anybody here ever study the clotting sequence in school? You know, I did it. It's a long time ago. Suffice it to say, when you cut yourself and red blood cells come to the surface, and, and depending on your body and what you're taking, because a lot of older people now are taking things that are, so they won't clot. But thousands of reactions take place that allow your blood to clot. If they don't do it in exactly the right cascade, it doesn't. A hemophiliac lacks one enzyme, and their blood doesn't clot. And now people tell me, and I have a thousand, a million different examples like that in my body where there are sequences that allow me to live, to breathe. That I, have, I produce insulin so that the glucose can be driven into my cells. That happened by accident. That just one day, there was a puddle of water on a rock and lightning struck it. There was a cell. And not only that, over time, that cell became a protozoan. And over time, that protozoan became a bird or a... And here's the joke. I could buy all that if you said, something's behind it. Some organizing factor. But no, I mean, can you believe if we came in here and this room is all set up, the chairs are set up perfectly, the tables, the altars, everything's just beautiful, and someone came in and said, just accidentally rolled into place. You, you'd laugh. But you're being expected to think that because if you'll buy that, there's nothing you won't buy. Greg. It always amazes me, uh, as you're talking about it, how intelligent people can be. I mean, brilliant, intelligent people. And yet, what we would say, how can the truth escape you? But it happens every day. And what, what came to my mind when I was thinking about stuff like this, and it amazes me even about the disciples. I mean, here the disciples were, all 12 of them. They were there with the Lord himself. I mean, the very words of God were being imparted to them. And yet the truth escaped them in some way. I mean, how, how, could it, how could that be that the disciples, in hearing the very words of God being implanted within them, seeing the miracles, seeing all the things that Jesus did, and then the truth ultimately, not entirely, but it escaped them. He struggled. And then the only thing that really brought that truth to mind is when they saw Jesus resurrected. And they said, oh, the truth has really come. We understand that we can, have, we can have all of this stuff. We can have all knowledge. We can have understanding of everything. And, let, and, let, and yet, if the truth of that love is not there, it, we become a sounding brass and tingling symbol. It just, the whole truth of it just escapes us if we don't recognize it that Jesus rose. And I think that this is kind of what, uh, kind of a, a perspective of what you're saying is that how could you get closer to the Lord than the disciples were? And yet, in many ways, they were a tremendous gulf between them. Well, you know, that's an interesting point, Greg, because I guess what I find out, and I have to be careful because I can be pretty disdainful, 
all of us have a capacity to reject the truth. Especially if we have, and, and like you're pointing out, the truth of who Yeshua, who Jesus is, and what he has done, it's very sensible, and yet it isn't. It, it, there's, a, there's an element of faith that's required, and Derek Prince is the first one who brought this out, and, and several commentators have noticed this. Paul was a brilliant speaker, and if you read the letters of Paul, there's a guy that understood logic, he knew the Talmud, he even knew the Greek poets. I mean, this guy was smart. He, you would never want to be in an argument with him. I mean, I have the feeling he never lost an argument, which is why he nearly died several times. You know, it's better to lose arguments, because when you never lose arguments, then people stone you. But he got up on Mars Hill in Athens and gave this just a brilliant presentation on who the God of the Bible is and why we should serve him. And we don't have any indication that one person believed. Then he went to Corinthians, to Corinth, and he said, you know, when I came here, I resolved to know nothing among you but Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. That was the biggest revival that we see in the New Testament. <laughs> and it reminds me sometimes that that the wrangling and the arguing doesn't accomplish much. It, it drives me crazy because I have probably too much of a mind that thinks critically. Uh, but that people swallow the stuff they do nowadays. And, and I think a lot of times it's because we don't have perspective. And I love, and this is not a Christian parable, but it's still a great parable. Uh, it, it comes from either Buddhism or Hinduism. And that's the one of the nine blind wise men and the elephant. And it, it's a tremendous story because all these nine wise blind men having trouble saying that wanted to know what an elephant was like. So if you're blind, what do you do? Yeah, you, you go feel the elephant. So they were brought there to see what an elephant was. And here, these are smart men. After about 20 minutes with the elephant, what were these guys doing? They were having a terrific fight because one had a hold of the ear and he says, I perceive an elephant is like a fan. And one was at the side of the elephant and he said, fan? An elephant is a wall. Somebody had the leg? No, it's neither of those, it's a tree. And somebody had the tusk, it's a spear. The trunk is a hose. I mean, and, you, and somebody else had the tail, it's a rope. And they were just furious with each other. Something interesting. They're blind so they can't see. But what could they have done to find out the truth? Could listen to each other, couldn't they? They could say, uh, let's trade. I got my hand. We, let me. And the guy on the tail switched with the guy. On, and, and what's funny is it wouldn't be that hard if we listened to each other. Because I think a lot of ways the kingdom is our eyes, what Greg just said. The kingdom is, it's in our spirit that we see it. And sometimes we're, our, our grasp is so small and, and I think another thing that happens, I, I, I think about this a lot because medicine is this way. We'll have people that will see, we'll, we'll go back to the vaccine thing. People die from vaccines. That's real. I've watched cattle die from vaccines. Get an anaphylactic reaction, they die. You, you need to be aware of that. Also, some people have a bad reaction to a vaccine. That is absolutely the truth. What you have to decide is what's the best thing to do for the population. And you have to, sometimes a doctor can be too removed from the personal. There are some people that should never have a vaccine. Immunocompromised people, you don't give them a vaccine. Doctors know this, you'll kill them. I think one of the most life-saving things I've seen in my life is the seatbelt. I really don't know of anything that has saved more lives and more hurt. I see people walk away from accidents with a few bangs or someone else in a less serious accident is dead because of their seatbelt. And yet, I know personally of an instance where if the guy had not been wearing his seatbelt, his injury would have been very mild and the seatbelt cut through his side and into his bowel. He went through three years and he never was right again. 
but should we not wear seat belts because of that bad experience? And this is why you have to listen to each other. Yeah? And, and why, especially based on these passages of Scripture we're looking at today, kind of what you were just saying, Greg, we have to be able to back up and say, Lord, I have a huge investment in this turning out this way. Help me to back up and see what are you doing? What do you want? I, I love a story Bob Mumford tells. And I don't know what you call them, but Jerry might, or some of you. You know these tables you make where you saw the two befores off and glue them together? And in the tabletop is a bunch of, they look neat. Uh, I would never attempt something like this. Bob Mumford made one of these tables. And when he got done, he wanted to check and see what a great job he'd done, and he grabbed a level and put it on it. And his table went like this. And I love what he said. He says, my first reaction is to take that level and bend it. <laughs> Isn't that what I re I mean, we're invested in this. Right? We want that table to be flat. We did all that work. And then we take the truth and put it next to it, and our table goes like this. And I don't know. There, there's something in us that gets very invested in the outcome that we want. I, I see this particularly, I see it in religion, I see it in politics, and, and I've noticed that if I really want an even-handed approach to what's going on in our country, I have a hard time finding the voice that does that. I can find the liberal side and I can find the conservative side, and they hate each other deeply, but that even-handed, you know, well, in fact, what I notice now are people that are willing to back up and say, well, maybe we need to give a little there and take a little. Those people are considered compromisers. And so the only solution is to stand on our respective posts and scream at each other. I don't know about you, that just doesn't seem to work. Yeah. Okay, great. Just one other comment. I, what's always impressed me is um, a story in the Bible about Paul. And here you have a man that was just, I mean, you couldn't be more zealous than Paul was. You couldn't be more connected as you were talking about <coughs> religiously. I mean, he, he knew everything. And uh, was he dedicated? Oh, you, you can match the dedication of somebody like Paul. And then he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. I can't even imagine the feeling of completely being undone by that. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't even imagine Jesus standing there and saying, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And just I, I could just feel that Paul was just literally melting away into nothingness. And he was confronted with the truth. That's a good point. And that's that's the truth that I think that I want to be confronted with, that we all want to be confronted with, that wipes out all of this other stuff that used to be important, that was seemingly vital to our lives, and yet it was absolutely meaningless when it comes to knowing and, and incorporating that truth within us. That's a, an interesting story, and we need to close. And I'm sure all of you have done this. I thought about the story of Paul confronting Yeshua. And, and what's interesting, it's like the story of the three wise men. I don't know how old I was when I realized the Bible never says he was knocked off his donkey. Anybody here thought he, think he was knocked off his donkey? I did. And one day I went looking for it. It's not there. But not saying it didn't happen, it's just not in the Bible. But I was thinking, what happened that Paul received this revelation? Because I was thinking, look at the people that watched Yeshua raise Lazarus from the dead. And some were praising the Lord, this is the Messiah. And others were thinking, we've got to kill him because the people will believe in him. What, what makes the difference in your response to the truth? And it's just something I'll share that I'm convinced at least had a huge part in Paul. And that Paul stood there holding the cloaks of the men who stoned Stephen. Now how did Stephen respond to it? Stephen was arguing. He was in their face and he was winning the argument. That's a big mistake. But when they were stoning him, he says, Father, forgive them. Lay not this into their charge. I, I could be wrong, but I am convinced that this opened something in Paul. 
so that when he was confronted with Yeshua, I think Greg described it perfectly. I think he was undone. He was, uh, because it, it's always amazing to me. Here's a man, his, his, he's going this direction. And God says, no, Paul, this direction. <laughs> but he accepts it. He's, he's a hero to me in that the truth comes, it's not his whole life, and he goes with it. We've wandered all around, but think of a couple things as we close today. There is an inextricable link between the Levitical priesthood and the truth and teaching. Ask yourself, how would God have you and have me? How can we share the truth? Because what Greg said, we want to share the truth in a way that heals, in a way that binds up the wounds, which sometimes I don't do. I, I love to debate until I lose, and then I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> but, but debates don't win souls, do they? But the truth is important. Look at what Paul says in Thessalonians. He says, those who can't love the truth will be lost, and God will send them a delusion. And the writings say it this way, that in that great day of wisdom, I think is the word it uses, that seventh day, it says, My, I'll have a people that will say, show unto me a truth, and it will be accepted. And you know, to be able to say, just show me the truth, I'll take the truth, requires a, a tremendous openness before the Lord. Sister Mary. I heard this um, joke about this group of scientists that went before God to argue their case that humanity no longer needed God, <laughs> touted you know, all their accomplishments going to the moon and vaccines and splitting the atom. And so God says, well, okay. He goes, well, we'll do a contest of creating a human. And so, you know, he gets his pile of dirt and so all the scientists go and get a pile of dirt. And he says, no, 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 you have to get your own dirt. And the response was, well, but we can't create something out of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that, and it's really kind of cute, isn't it? Get your own dirt. <laughs> because where did that dirt come from? No, it's, it's, it's perfect, isn't it? It, uh, I, you know, i just always reminded that we are so blessed to have grown up in a culture of faith. With all the flaws and the imperfections, I'm so grateful for the teachers, dorm parents, mentors in my life, that unilaterally, universally, all of them fed my life with faith. And that foundation is so important because when that faith is broken, it's very difficult sometimes for people to come back. And maybe the only way to wake them up is to tell them to get their own dirt. <laughs> Brother Doug, would you close for us, please? Father, we're so, so blessed today, Lord, to realize that the truth does make us free. And so let us listen to the truth in our hearts about everything. Realize, Lord, that you are the truth. You're the light, you're the way. May that guide us and direct us and fill us at all times with that Holy Spirit to do that. Thank you, Father, for Johan and his words and the wisdom that he has. And sharing with us the many experiences to help us understand more of the scriptures and <coughs> help us, Lord, and just keep our eye on you in all things and at all times. Bless us now with your love and grace and dismiss us from this part of our church service with the love of Jesus in our hearts. And we just say it in Yeshua's name. Amen. <laughs>